it's bicycle and tricycle or CCAD. So, uh, as well as the pedestrian, so uh, it kind of a shared space for both the uh, vehicles and the pedestrian. And then it also serves as access to various establishments across the market and the other establishments or stalls around it. And then, however, Zamora Street is a car centric and does it provide uh, safe crossing for pedestrians, especially uh, during evening peak hours. So, uh, as you can see in the image, no, we have uh, you can as you can see, uh, there are people no crossing mm -hmm. the street uh, while there are kind of vehicles passing also. So, uh, this was during uh, Friday, five to six p.m. So peak hours, yeah, and then. Uh, as for my site analysis, po, uh, so here uh, I have one. So uh, here, uh, street is a shared space. Uh, as, I, as I said a while ago, street is a shared space among motorists and non-motorist vehicles as well as the pedestrians. And then there are no, number two, uh, there are no designated uh, crosswalks for safe pedestrian crossing. So in this corner i hope you can see my arrow for a while mm -hmm. <laughs> i'll use laser pointer na lang po. so here number two so there are no designated uh, designated crosswalks for safe pedestrian ca crossing and then number three uh sidewalk pedestrian zone of various establishments are used as parking area so most of the uh front front area of the establishments were used as parking area pero it's not really designated for parking and then number four so sidewalk has no street furniture zone and buffer zone so therefore not physically separated from the street so uh, no separation ang sidewalk from the uh, Zamara street mm -hmm. okay and then moving on so uh, in designing the, uh, in doing my proposed design for Zamora Street, so these are the uh, three pre design principles that I considered. So I have uh, here inclusivity, safety, aesthetic, and value. So for in inclusivity, uh, a street should be designed for everyone with particular attention to people with disabilities, seniors, and children. And then a street, a street is designed for a range of mobility choices, prioritizing active and sustainable modes of transport and then for safety naman to cater everyone a street should be safe and comfortable to use especially to the most uh, vulnerable use users and then a street should uh, support access to various services and destinations allowing safe efficient and comfortable experiences for the users and then safety markings and signages should be introduced to a street to reinforce yielding and then lastly for aesthetic and value aside from the pathway for movement a street is a public space for cultural expression and social interaction. It entices people to stay and spend time at various establishments accessible to it. So uh, this is based on the uh, book that you shared, Sir Katong Senatko, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so uh, sorry. here is my proposed redesign. Po. So uh, the letters for uh, represents the establishments around the uh, mostly front part sa uh, Ozami City Public Mall. And then I have here numbers no, representing the my proposed redesign. So one here, tapos here also, uh, one uh, in, introduction of crosswalks now with accessible car ramps for safe pedestrian crossing. And then number two, uh, introduction of raised crossing to increase visibility and yielding behavior for safe pedestrian crossing. And then I introduced also raised uh, crosswalk here since it is fronting Mangod, the Unitap or Unitip, Unitap Mall and then the mm. front, front road of the Azami City Public Mall. And then number three, uh, integration of advanced uh, stop bar at least 2.5 meters before the crosswalks to reinforce yielding to pedestrians and then number four so the shared space for motorists and non-motorist vehicles is now divided into four lanes 
So uh, you will see later kung sa, uh, uh, how I divided it into four lanes. And then number five, uh, some of the frontage spaces are utilized as designated parking uh, area with respect to the sidewalk. Then the sidewalks are separated from the street through uh, previous planting strips. So uh, I chose to designate parking areas na since uh, it might be difficult for those who are going to the city public mall or the other establishments here. Uh, Wala still a parking area, so uh, I designated parking areas mm -hmm. here since so the kind of establishments. And then number six, uh, the side areas will be utilized as uh, small terminals and the displaced vendors will be relocated also to the empty stalls lining the market. So there are empty stalls here and then some of the vendors mang good kin as uh, from sa mga establishments, so might as well uh, relocate them into somewhere na mas cluster and mas safe and then hopefully the terminal terminals also are kanang more arranged and designated really for terminal okay and then okay. i have here the section for so this section ah, ah, wait uh, before you proceed uh Alaska. go back to yes so this side is very good um, I think going towards the final, my suggestion would be, I forgot to mention sa canvas, is that you have different elements here, no? So yes. just to make it a bit easier to read, number one could have a different color from number two, three, four, five, so that it's easier to read. You can just do that sa final lang. And okay. anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So uh, I cut here, diri lang ko nag -cut, sir, for my section. Ah, so, okay. I have here, uh, this is representing uh, unit top, and then this one is uh, uh, public mall. So I utilize the arcaded sidewalk, na, sir, pero I, I introduced uh, planters so that mm -hmm. uh, I can separate the sidewalk to this uh, space here. And then mm -hmm. as you can see, I have parking area na, for motorcycles and then for cars also. And then the Four lanes that I said a while ago is composed of two bicycle and tricycle lanes and then lanes for cars, pedicab, and trucks. So I think that's all for. Okay. Uh, can I can you freeze that slide there? Okay. I think I mentioned this in your canvas foot. Um if not, then uh, we can just make it for the final. I'll share my screen. So uh, ah, yeah, you can stop sharing. So Benson, this is basically our midterm uh, project. So with our discussions, you should be able to identify uh, a street or a local area that we can apply our principles on. So uh, I'll need you to go through each of the seat works, uh, those that you haven't finished yet. I'll probably need to check it as well. So give me like a week on that. And then maybe on top of the this assignment for this week, you'll also need to do something like this. So a uh, lot of catch up time. So we, definitely it will take more than a week, maybe like uh, two weeks or three weeks. Just just keep me updated. Anyway, so um, I think the um, issue na ko here um, is the fact that you have parking areas and then uh, separating the sidewalk and the bicycle lanes. For me, this is a bit um, uh, a bit dangerous because sayang na you have this like sort of like storage space as, with the parking areas, and they're pushing the bicycle lanes outside without onto the the moving traffic. Um, my suggestion would be to look at the possibility of having the bicycle lanes inside. So uh, I'm not sure if this is possible in your area. Because uh, in your experience, what do you think? Is that possible if you could move the bicycle lanes inside in the parking areas here? Mag switch sila. Uh, I'm not sure, po, sir. Pero sige, sir, I'll try po. Yeah, uh, review lang po sa yung uh, street street uh, reference that I gave you because. Um, the idea really is to separate the slow moving traffic with the fast moving traffic. And since 
this is a motorcycle parking area and then they just turn into the most motor par motorcycle parking area there's a chance that they might um uh intersect or collide with people on bicycles so just remove that possibility by moving the uh vehicle parking area next to the vehicle sort of uh roadway so all, these are all vehicles and you remove uh, you separate the non-motorized traffic, the walking and cycling, from the motorized traffic, the motorcycles and the cars. So just switch that. And I think I would even go further now, <laughs> dog. I would even go further to have the sidewalk here. So and then next to the sidewalk will be the bicycle lane over here. And then after the bicycle lane, you would have your planters. So planters and then your vehicle parking. So I'll just V vehicle parking and then your uh, carriageway, your vehicle carriageway VC, something like that. So the non-motorized mode of transport is totally separate uh, from the motorized by a like uh, your planters. So that's my only suggestion for this. And we can like look in look further into that uh, going to the finals. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Okay. So our finals. Uh, speaking of finals, the finals is. We're up until, I think the last day of class is November 17. Let me double check. Uh, 2022. Oh, there we go. So last day of class is December. Oops, sorry. Yeah, December 17 is classes end. So we're only until December 17. It's already the 11th. So we have one two, three, four, five weeks. So basically a month to wrap up. Okay. So uh, most, of, uh, most of the presentations were very good. I, um, Sheena, what did you use to render uh, the, these images? Photoshop. Photoshop and AutoCAD? Yes, both. Ah, okay. It looks really good. <laughs> okay. So you can see my slides are not yet complete. Uh, but I can work with it. So this 1900s POD is, I don't know what POD is. Usually I just like uh, quickly go into uh, Wikipedia for it. But anyway, so it's my turn. So tonight we'll talk about local community development patterns. I know I said contemporary, but um, for urban design, these are uh, fairly new. I think transit-oriented development is uh, post-World War II, so 1940s, sort of connecting our discussion with the urban development patterns. So we're looking at sort of the city level with these development patterns, and uh, as you've done the seat works, and then all of these models sort of define or, or uh, measure the same thing. It's just cities growing outwards, but um, the the newer models are more kind of realistic because they um include or like they consider more factors than the earlier model so the earliest one was 1920s and then all the way we have uh, 1997 and then the latest one really considers the popularity of private vehicles and the tendency of cities to sort of leapfrog uh meaning the the new cbd is even further away than the original cbd and we can see this all over the philippines and also uh, abroad and then what I want to focus on tonight is what's going on in those like uh, uh, CBDs and residential areas. So most of the development patterns we'll be looking at today will be focused on kanang the neighborhood unit, or I guess the equivalent will be a barangay. Because but even then, even even barangays in the Philippines have various sizes. So so what is this uh, neighborhood unit so it's focusing more on residential and institutional uses so this is the co uh, during that time 19 early 1900s was the ideal model for creating a sustainable uh, desirable neighborhood in america so this american based again um unfortunately the asian based sort of urban development patterns uh, urban design patterns we don't have much information on and we're mostly trained in kanang american and uk sort of uh, development patterns that could be a very interesting um research topic for like asian development patterns we don't have much information on that anyway so what is this neighborhood unit so over here on the right side 
you can see the radius or the size of this uh, um, development is one fourth of a mile or about 400 meters. Uh, the reason for this is they want to target a five minute walk. So again, nibalik na si walkability. So this is all the way 1900s. Huh? So this walkability, walkable idea isn't new. And then it's kind of the fact that it stayed around what's almost like um, more than a hundred years now, which means it means that there's something here that we can that's really kind of applicable and important. And then that's why we did our midterms on like cycling, walking, other modes of transportation, because it really benefits um, cities like everywhere. Other things here, I wish I could uh, show you a colored version. I'll show you in the next slide. So this area is about 160 acres. You can convert that to hectares on your end. So the goal is to house enough people to support one elementary school. So um, there's some descriptions in the next slide. I'll show you in a bit. And then preferable shape will be all sides are fairly equidistant from the center. Roads uh, connect where possible. And then in the periphery, this is where you have your kanang civic buildings or kanang malls. So this cross hatch are civic buildings. This single hatch are kanang malls. So workshops and offices, like commercial areas, and like um, shopping centers here at high traffic intersections, uh, parking parking corridor along boulevards, uh, schools located shared by adjacent neighborhood, and then each playground, uh, a playground in each quadrant. So like open space. So these dotted lines here, that uh, sort of this dot hatching is open space. And then over here on the left side is um, current day Cebu City. And then as you saw in like our history class, I think I can bring up an image. Um, okay, no, I'll keep the slide on and uh, refrain from using the internet for a minute just to keep your focus. So we already have like, Cebu City and wherever you are, some of you, we sh you showed your maps. There's a lot. There's some. There's some sort of kanang foundations of this neighborhood unit, probably because uh, during the American occupation they started these kinds of developments. And you sh and you usually find these like in city centers. The problem is that today they kind of like forgot the neighborhood unit or the ideals of the neighborhood unit, and then. Um, uh, it's it's both good and bad because it's can um, I guess for lack of a better term it's not a good idea to copy paste wholesale development patterns it's more about integrating or contextualizing the ideas that they want but in Cebu City particularly we kind of lost this um, uh, what do you call this this idea that walking is important more and more people are driving again because probably of the weather etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, I think it's really good to kind of bring it back. And then sort of I'm showing you this so that everyone in our class realizes that this has been around for over 100 years now, this idea of walkability. And then why is it still kind of, uh, why have we forgotten it, <laughs> basically? OK, so the neighborhood unit, these are more sort of uh, definitions. Sorry for the wall of text. I didn't have time to edit. So. The neighborhood unit is centered around the school so that um, what what do families need? Like we have a home, so they need uh, access to education, they need access to food, and to make it uh, more equitable, so meaning like poor families, rich families can like live in this sort of similar area. Driving is uh, limited and walking is kind of, what do you call this, is, sort of enhanced. So within a five, five minute walk, 400 meters in American um, standard, maybe in the Philippines because of our climate, it will should it should be reduced to like 200 meters probably. Because if you walk 400 meters in afternoon heat, I don't think a lot of Filipinos will like that. So another, uh, some key figures here, the size of the neighborhood uh, suffic should, should sufficiently support the school. So that's about 5,000 and 9,000 residents. So that's a moderately sized barangay in the Philippines. Approximately 160 acres at a density of 10 units per acre. So 10 residential units per acre. So this is more kind of, um, flexible. It should be contextualized or updated to your local community standards. So um, last 
in the midterm, so we're just focusing on a single street. And then we, we will continue to focus on that single street. But let's look around at the what's going on around those streets. So the Antique Group identified different uses, like the residential areas along the school. And um, those uh, solo uh, groups might have uh, might consider looking at um, the different spaces around their um, their streets. I know our previous presenter already listed down all the different commercial areas, so that's a good start. Okay, so next is can I place arterial streets along the perimeter. This is not a urban design issue. This is more of an urban planning issue because we can urban designers can maybe recommend um, new streets, new roads. But most of the time, um, I would like to think as urban designers, as interior designers compared to architects. So we'll be working with like smaller spaces, trying to achieve the goals set by um, sort of the, the, the city level or the kind of, uh, municipal level planning. And then uh, we have a sort of hierarchy of roads here or streets. So we have the arterial streets where your like vehicle traffic is probably think think roads with um, speeds of like 60 above kilometers per hour. And then internal streets, or these are the slower streets, so maybe uh, 40 to 30 kilometers per hour, less focus on vehicle traffic and more focus on non-motorized traffic, like walking, cycling. So really need that mix. And this was around, this idea has been around since the 1900s. And then um, there are some examples of this uh, abroad, but they don't have the same name anymore. They don't call it the neighborhood unit anymore. They just call it like a sustainable planning or kanang, currently we, they call it like a, um, kanang, transit oriented development, which I will show you in the, in the next slide. And I think the latest idea of this is the 15 minute city, which I, I will show you also. Okay. So um, restrict local shopping areas to the, to the perimeter. This one is the most kind of, uh, strange one to me because um, they only want the shopping areas outside and they don't want it to be inside. So this is uh, very evident of like 1900s thinking. There's that segregation of use, uh, whereas in the early 2000s, mixed use was more, more promoted. So this one is the uh, one number I don't think we should apply today. And then dedicate at least 10% of the neighborhood land area to parks and open space. So creating a play community, creating spaces for play and community interaction. So you're, we have that here, and then we don't have that in the Philippines. And I feel that's what we need more. Um, aside from like um, what do you call this, new malls, etc. We need really need new uh, public parks and open spaces. So that goes hand in hand with like street development. Okay, so this is the colored version, so you can see it more clearly. So on the left-hand side is the original 1900 sort of neighborhood, neighborhood unit. And then on the right-hand side here is a sort of modern, like 2000s, uh, maybe like 2010 interpretation of the same idea. So we see here in the center, you have your community center, like a plaza. You have your churches, you have your town hall, your city hall, etc. And in yellow are the residential units. And then in orange are the commercial units. And then the red uh, circle here is the sort of 400 meter radius or the one fourth mile radius. You have the main highways around it. And then you have the internal roads inside the neighborhood unit. So the challenge here is that in the Philippines, we don't have this kind of existing infrastructure. Uh, maybe in some of the kanang, um, younger cities but in cebu city i think we the closest is um the uh, cebu city Colon area our like heritage site where, where where we still have this kind of sort of development pattern but the newer uh if you go into cebu city we don't have this pattern anymore more likely um, um places like uh that are not so populated yet have a chance to develop in this way but um, this is more of an urban planning issue, but it's good for urban designers to be aware so that they can sort of um, see the big picture bit out and then we can apply that to our street design. Okay, over here, we have like a newer interpretation of the neighborhood unit. Uh, you see area preferably 160 acres again, um, and then population of 400 dwellings and then so that's about 
So average uh, dwelling size in the Philippines may be like four, per four people in one house, maybe five even. So that's 400 times five, maybe like uh, 2,000 people. So it's a bit smaller population size wise. So you see in this new sort of interpretation of neighborhood unit, you have the civic center here, your uh, civic buildings like uh, city hall, um, like uh, major sort of like public buildings. And then you have some commercial areas here in darker gray, uh, district energy plant, mixed use. So this is the newer version. So it has mixed use, uh, main uh, street with uh, third, with, I don't know, what does this third place mean? <laughs> Let's see, uh, uh, diverse buildings and dwellings, so mixed use in the periphery, purely kind of residential uses in white, and you see in green the uh, open space or parks. So they also changed it from a five-minute walk to a 10-minute walk. So whether you want to walk five minutes or 10 minutes, that's really more of a kind of cultural thing. I think in the Philippines, some people will be willing to walk 10 minutes while some people will still want the five minutes. So this will need some kind of like um, uh, what are the cultural studies, which is which could also be a specialization of uh, urban designers. Currently, the Philippine Institute of Environmental Planners is the closest thing we have to like uh, uh, a planning group, like an official license group of like um, urban planners, but urban designers kind of like fall into that as well. There's no like uh, urban designer in a license. So we have to be aware of like what the urban planners are doing. Okay, so any questions about uh, the neighborhood unit so far? Anyone, voila, clear, huh? <laughs> Okay, clear, huh? Yes, question, go ahead. Who is that? Ah, no, Mike. Okay, okay. I'll just this finish here. High density areas, commercial structures like malls are integrating open space inside their malls, sir. Not just attracting people, sir. Also, yes. So that's good. It's good that uh, the malls are integrating uh, open space. Um, the 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 only issue there for me is that you need to be inside the mall to access the open space. So um, it's kind of it's semi-public, but there are some malls now you don't have to be inside the mall to access the open space. Like for example, let's go to, do you have any examples, uh, Richard? Uh, I'll just show you the example in Cebu City. I think we showed one last week, right? uh, or two, was that two weeks ago? So uh, the one I experienced here in Cebu City is we have a like park area here, open park, but it's within the mall. So this is Ayala, uh, center Cebu City. Ah, sorry. So this is the open space here. And then you have another one here on the side. So uh, my issue is that when I say public open park, I mean really mean that you don't have to be kanang a shopper or like a kanang someone with money to access the mall. Uh, but this is a good start. If you can give me some examples, please uh, type it in the chat. And then I think the closest sort of public park Cebu City has is this uh, Osmania Circle. And unfortunately, it's uh, not the best park as well because number one, it's not that big. And then also access is difficult because to get into the park, I'll zoom in here, you need to cross one, two, three, six lanes of traffic and you only have a painted pedestrian sidewalk. I visited this place maybe only once in my entire life in Cebu City. So it's not very attractive and it's not very kind of, uh, it's not a good place to go because there's really nothing here. <laughs> so um, do you have any examples? Uh, Bonifacio Heights, nice. Yes, I think we mentioned this last time. Okay. Uh, BGC, so Bonifacio, um, what does it stand for again? The Bonifacio. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, here we go. So let's take a look at this. I'm not familiar with the, the developments in Manila because like I've, I've had my handful with uh, the development developments here in Cebu. So we see here, where am I? 
So this is Bonifacio Global City, sorry. So let's take a look. Seems to me this is very open. Uh, residential areas are here. You can see the small houses separated by a highway. Are there any kanang, um, residential uses? Ah, here. Here we go. I think these are residential buildings over here, like apartment types. Yeah, they, these are definitely apartment types. Sort of uh, how tall is this thing? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, nine, twelve, thirteen. But I think mid rise or maybe high rise nasha more than uh more than fifteen stories, siguro. So that's good, very kanang um contemporary. Uh for the most part, uh this is just a tangent on residential uh buildings. Um there's been studies going on that like high rise residential areas are not very kanang good for the residents in the long run. Okay, a lot of adverse psychological effects in high-rise living now. Pro, I think for I think that's mostly for Western countries, the Asian countries like Filipinos and like uh, Chinese, Singapore, Singaporeans really don't mind living in high-rise. But um, that could be another interesting topic for you, like uh, if you're into uh, if you're interested in that. Okay, so this is a clear uh, public area. And notice the bicycle, uh, the cyclists really want to be inside the sidewalk and not along the along the road with the vehicles. Because <laughs> that's just like uh, human nature. You don't feel safe if all if the only thing that's separating you and a moving vehicle is a uh, is paint. But this is a good example of uh, what I mean when I say public open space. So you don't have to be inside the mall, and anyone can like freely access it. Of course, there are safety issues like what if kanang mga uh, homeless start coming in, uh, the image of the residents might, or like uh, the users might not be kanang the best, but that's just like something you need to um, um, accept. Now, if you need, uh, yes, go ahead. At first, I know there's some ADGC kasi bawal pumasok yung mga homeless. Mm. Like, they really enforce sa, ano, sa mga boundaries. Mm -mm. So parang ilang meters pa lang pinapalabas na hinabot na. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then in a way it's not very humane no if you think about it. Now it's supposed to be for the people but we the the homeless and the disenfranchised are kind of it's not for you. It's only for those with money. <laughs> that's another like uh, social issue yeah, but that's yeah. a that's a whole nother topic na. It's kind of for me I'm not a I don't have much experience dealing with that so there's a lot of problems that there it's a very complex problem to create like an open space that's really for everyone especially with our culture now we look at poor people as like kawatan and then yeah it's also there's also some truth now one they're a bit dangerous bro yeah how do you fix that that's a whole issue on poverty now it's very it's it's too big just for urban designers to fix but anyway, yeah, so this is a good example of that. And then let's try to compare this with the neighborhood unit. So I think for the most part, these are all commercial areas here in the center. You have like uh, offices, you have restaurants, and then sort of nabali. Instead of like the residential areas in the center, the residential areas are in the outside. So you see here, the these are residences in Nor Manila, uh, Forbes Park Lane. So you can you see here also like a circular sort of pattern. Let's see how big this thing is. So I'll measure distance up until sort of the edge here. Let's see if it's within, oh, it's actually 800 meters wide, uh, 800 meters long. And it's a bit kanang long distance to travel, like within our class. Uh, sorry, someone's printing. It's okay. <laughs> Within our class, um, would you walk 800 meters? <laughs> um, ano sir, experience ko with Bonifacio High Street. I always walk mm. this area. So ah, I'm okay. It's so walkable for you. From, okay, that's good. from Serendra, yung dito na mga mar maraming, ano, from Serendra, Serendra mm. na, ano, na culture unit, all the way to my museum. Kasi, um, that area is Puro Park siya. And then marami siyang mga events na like free concerts every weekend. Tapos mm -hmm. puro mga shops yung sa gilid, like high-end. So parang hindi mo mafeel na 
ano na siya, na malayo na yung nilalakad mo. Mm. So, maganda po yung ambience within that area. Ah, um, I okay. think that's one way then na they encourage people talaga to walk. Instead of, yeah, like, um, if you were walking in this kind of area, really, it's no problem, di ba? That's almost gone na. Um, so, how far is your travel distance? Around 800 din? Or is it a bit more? Yeah, kung minsan, sir, pa, ano, on, papuntang my museum and then balik ulit ako, going to Serena. Mm, all the way to the museum. So, end to end. Yes, sir. End to end, tapos balik ulit. <laughs> ah, okay. So, until so, here. On the end, yes. That's one kilometer na. <laughs> That's good exercise. Yeah, so, <laughs> pabalik. So, parang almost two kilometers. <laughs> two na. Two na every day. So, that's good cardio. <laughs> so, really, if the infrastructure right, uh, sorry, the infrastructure is there, like it's good, it's like uh, attractive, it you have a lot of trees, a lot of vistas, so it's not kind of a, has, a, hassle, a hassle to walk. <laughs> okay, good. Meanwhile, I'll just go back here to Cebu City because this is the place I have most experience in. Uh, it's very difficult to find one kilometer that's good to walk. For example, let's say here, uh, clear measurement. I'll measure the Fuente Osmeña Circle to our like one of our older buildings, the Capitol Building. That's about 700 meters. And for me, this isn't, uh, it's an okay walk. I don't really kind of work in this area, but the times that I did walk in this area, it's doable. But it's not as attractive because the thing is you're next to vehicles, you're next to um, the the trees don't provide that much shading because like some of them are like uh, sparse and uh, no leaves. And then it's loud and like really kind of you're in the middle of traffic. And then this is something that urban designers can do with kind of new land, like a new kind of undeveloped land like this, for example, like if it's all green. The challenge is what do we do with the uh, already built up areas? So like we need a lot of policies, we need a lot of like uh, uh, public-private partnerships. And currently in Cebu City, I think this area here is undergoing that change. Um, if you look at um, Cebu City, Colon area, we have the carbon market redevelopment. And you see there's already a good quality of sidewalk. It's just uh, what amenities can they provide? Okay, so that's basically it for a neighborhood unit. So even now you see the principles of the neighborhood the neighborhood unit being applied. So the next thing here when I, I basically ran out of time is transit-oriented development. So this came out like post-World War II, around 1950s, something like that. And then you see here, now it still looks similar to the neighborhood unit, but it's like a half circle. You have offices at the periphery uh, public space in the middle, and then residential uh, on the upper side again. So residential, you go to public space, you go to a transit stop, usually a train station or maybe a bus station. And then next to the transit station is the offices and like core commercial areas. And then it's basically a simplified version of the neighborhood unit with a focus on um, what kind of transit is available in that city and it's now 2000 feet let me convert that real quick because i ran out of time 2000 feet two meters about 600 meters so uh the original one was the original sort of uh neighborhood unit was 400 meters the updated neighborhood unit was now 800 meters and then this tod um let me check when this was developed I usually just like go to Wikipedia. Uh, let me open this a new tab. Let me check the history here. Uh, do, 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 do. It doesn't say. It's just post-World War II. So let's just say 1940s. I'll just put here uh, 1940s. So let me open up a, the TOD website over here. Okay, I really ran out of time. So let me zoom in on this. So factors are the, the components of transit-oriented development. So again, they have, I'll just highlight it here. That's a, this part. So we have walkable design, 
We have train station as a prominent feature of a town center. A uh, public square fronting the train station. A regional node, so meaning like a center uh, containing mixed use of uh, mixture of uses, so office, residential, etc. High density, walkable district within 10 minutes walk cycle, so that's about 800 meters US, uh, US standard, and maybe also Philippine standard, just based, uh, it just really depends on the design or the quality of the walk. Uh, collector roads or like streets support transit systems, including streetcar, light rail, buses, etc. Designed to include easy use of bicycles, scooters as daily transport, large ride-in bicycle parking areas, bike share, etc. 10-minute walk, blah, blah, blah. So basically the same, but with a focus on what is the mode of transportation. In the neighborhood unit, it's only walking and a bit of driving, but here there's a focus on a mix of uh, uh, transportation so walking cycling uh, train and also like light rail maybe even streetcar etc so this has been around since the 1940s so they always say always the same thing better quality of life increased rider trends uh, increased ridership healthier lifestyle etc etc so let's see here so the benefits of transit-oriented development, so more people uh, reduce dependence on driving. So as we mentioned before, so if there's more people walking, cycling, there's less people driving. So lower ang traffic congestion. And then we have um, uh, more different uh, uses like um, live, work, and play areas within the sort of 600-meter um, radius. And because lesser cars, lesser carbon footprint, uh, they always say better access to life. And currently, interesting, uh, that wasn't mentioned in the neighborhood unit, is that if there are more people on the streets, there's more people like buying uh, within the community, like uh, more kind of better quality sari sari stores, um, because the neighborhood includes a commercial area. So people from offices, they have like higher sort of uh, disposable income, so they can buy more things. So they would say that there's like a, this type of development would stimulate the local economy, uh, provide better access between urban and suburban areas. Again, because more people are walking and cycling, there's less traffic, so it's easier to move from one TOD, transit-oriented development, to another TOD. So uh, the idea is now, like within our different like CBDs, we're trying to uh, create more compact, more kind of, um, options for transportation and that would create easier movement between different like cities and municipalities and etc etc so let's look at uh, let's see here since we're talking about streets let's look at uh, kanang transport so um the tod really focuses on a complete transport system so it's not just reliance on one mode of transportation but several so the first one to five miles, let's just convert that uh, to meters. Miles, miles, one to five. So the first one, one mile is about, let's just change to kilometer, 1.6 kilometers. Five miles is eight kilometers. So the first uh, five to eight kilometers, you have uh, walking and cycling. So maybe that's a bit uh, optimistic for philippine for filipinos like uh we uh Kisato, who who was talking again earlier <laughs> secret crystal though uh, yes sir yeah uh, yes, crystal sir. walks uh two kilometers back and forth <laughs> i know took one kilometer back and forth so two kilometers about uh, every day <laughs> something like that and then they're saying here now you we can bump it up to eight kilometers so maybe possible i don't know it's a bit kind of optimistic uh, even for me <laughs> actually and then, sir yung sa may hmm. ano ko po sir yung sa may hmm. research ko po yung along uh, uh mayor san chago let's see road which is yung sa may ano rin po namin sayo hmm. sa may project actually yung yung nilalakad ng mga student parang every day pupuntang uh uh B parang center ng poblacion is mga around mm -hmm. 600 to 700 meters. And I don't know, hindi naman maganda yung ano yung 
yung uh, sidewalk pero I think one thing talaga na nag nag uh, uh, pupush at student kasi maraming mga commercial establishments sa paligid mm. so kahit parang siguro in the morning and afternoon pero pag mga ano mga noon time hindi talaga siya possible <laughs> <laughs> oh nga kasi without shade it and then 12 o'clock noon time 3 p.m. is really difficult even for me like um uh i really don't go out like during those times <laughs> especially if, it, if i have to walk okay moving on so the next uh let's see um like 20 kilometers ish like 15 to 20 uh you have your uh, private vehicles you have your jeepneys your buses and your light rail so this is something that it's currently lacking in the Philippines, but eventually uh, the government has to invest. I think it's already investing heavily on trains. Um, uh, I shared with you the uh, mobility summit in Cebu and some of the speakers there also mentioned that uh, Manila is heavily investing in like more trains, um, more public transportation. And I'll give you the link to that. Uh, for those who don't have that link, you can go back to the modules, it's there. Then finally, um, uh, air, airlines to connect like all our different sort of uh, our, uh, cities. So this is basically the thrust of the uh, transit-oriented development. And then from this, uh, we get the, uh, I ran out of <laughs> images for my slides. Uh, we have new urbanism. So sort of going back to that residential development, I'll just use Google, okay, I really didn't have time now. New urbanism introduces this idea of kanang the transect. So I'll show it to you over here. Uh, that's not a high quality image, maybe this one. Okay. Oops. So the transect system is the idea that the density and volume of structures sort of increase when you get to the CBD and it decreases as you go away from the CBD. I'm not sure if I showed you guys, I feel like I showed you guys this before, bro, my memory is like very kind of uh, bad now because I'm so busy. So you still have that kind of, um, they're not talking about like distances, but there, there's this kind of mix of uses. So a you have the urban core, similar to what we looked at at the uh, patterns of urban development. And within the urban core, you have both residential, commercial, institutional, and sometimes maybe even kind of, uh, industrial use. I think the industrial uses would go here. It's a special district where they, you, need, you can't get to it by walking. You have to use cars. Uh, think like industrial buildings, like kind of, um, like power plants, uh, the sort of the places where you can um, get gasoline, um, oil, oil, oil plants, something like that. And then you have the urban center zones, so a bit further away from the urban core. You have um, some detached housing, maybe duplexes and single detached housing. And then further from that, you have the general urban zone. And then this is more single detached houses you see here. And then the suburban zone. So what we have currently, like uh, suburban developments, we're just single detached with like a large front yard and backyard, rural zone, and then the natural zone. So some criticisms of this type of thinking is that um, urban development isn't so clean. It has to be messy. Okay, that's just the way people live. There's there's no like clear clear cut different zones. So this is just sort of. Um, a new way of thinking it didn't really like uh become popular i would say the new urbanism movement started in like uh 2010s like early 2000s something like that and then it gained traction like 2005 2010 but then it slowly kind of like uh faded away i think it's because they were so kind of rigid with their ideas now it has to be separated like this and then um, people kind of realize that urban design, urban planning is messy and you can't have this like clear division. But the, uh, the intent of dividing up areas like this was again to make sure that everyone has equal access to the land. And then you still have that idea that um, walkability is available, 
but for them they're really more focused on the form um the form of the city so urban core has high-rise buildings urban center has mid-rise buildings and then you go low-rise buildings in the general urban and then single-story buildings when you get to suburban zone so it's more of a form-based sort of zoning idea and this is interesting for urban designers because then you can think about does this street the street you're currently working on so you're just looking at the sidewalks and the pedestrian lanes and the bicycle lanes what about the building heights do you think that uh in your particular project the antique group and those like solo groups do you think um moderating or regulating the building heights could have a pa positive impact on your streets so that's more like a rhetoric question but the answer is yes so for example um let me open up the previous presentation over here see uh sheena's presentation let me just do 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 okay and then loading okay one thing that was highlighted by uh crystal was that her walk uh her one kilometer walk back and forth was very comfortable because she was shaded there were a lot of vegetations a lot of things to see so in urban design we have the capacity to sort of advise the urban planners and city planners now what if the building heights could be kind of regulated as well so um this is can you give me the address of this location uh zamora street osama city zamora street Osame city and don't worry i'll end i'll end soon because like i know it's late <laughs> and i ran out of slides uh, here we go so let's look at um this street in particular in osame city so we can divide up the the street as uh, however we like. like for example we have like a client that says oh you can do that but another issue here would be the building heights and then what is the impact of the building heights or the building forms to our kind of, uh, quality of our streets? So the biggest thing is the, the shade the buildings may be able to provide. So I'm looking at Zamora Street here. Let me orient it north. So east is here. I'll just go back to my snip. So this is east and this is west down here. So during the mornings if we have an appropriate building height so two stories i think is good enough for this area so for example so in the morning this area here will be shaded but in the afternoon this area here will be shaded and then this area i'll just switch to red pen during the afternoon this area will be hot and during the morning this area will be hot so maybe if we increase yeah, just it's just a sample scenario i'm not saying that this this area should have so and so building height but if you increase the building height here to like let's say four for example lang, i'm not saying they should but if they increase the building height to like four in this area the the shading provided by the buildings will also increase so this is just a very simple kind of way that the building heights can Im impact our streets so no matter if it's morning or afternoon it's always shaded but the next question here is maybe some buildings want the natural lighting and then it will be very dark here in the middle that that's another issue but um i just want to highlight that the form of the buildings also impact your kanang streets and this, this could be another kanang subject that you might want to look into when we go to your like final presentation of your streets okay sorry it's eight o'clock i'll wrap up quickly and then I'll update this presentation for you guys next week. I'll still work on it. So heritage conservation, I promise you will talk, I promised you guys that we'll talk about this, is that we have the Cultural Heritage Act of 2009, RA 10066. So it covers the totality of cultural property preserved and developed through time and passed on to prosperity. Usually a heritage building is something, a building that's like over 50 years old. And usually the the advice is preserve it maintain it don't change its colors don't change its form just keep it the way as is and try to keep it as historically accurate as possible 
So a lot of our areas in the Philippines, we have a lot of like historical sites. And for uh, this is one of the main attractions in Cebu being uh, one of the older cities in the Philippines. We have several heritage sites. And in fact, the local government has created this uh, yearly event called uh, Gabi'i sa Kabilin, which is basically a heritage walk. So it starts out here in the Museo Sugbo. It goes down here to like Fort San Pedro, our like historical fort, going down to Malacanang sa Cebu, basically a building that was designed to look like Malacanang in Manila. And then down here to uh, the Campania Mar Maritima, this like um, a building, I'm not, I've been there. <laughs> uh, the Gochanko building is a Chinese heritage uh, museum. Magellan's Cross, I think everyone is familiar with this. Uh, apparently the site where Magellan landed. Santo Nino Basilica, then all the way up. I won't name all of those spaces. This is what Santo, Basil Santo Nino Basilica looks like today. And they were able to preserve the frontage. It's just that on the right side here is uh, vehicle traffic. So it only looks good. It only looks good on this side. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so heritage conservation is already supported by a Republic Act. So it's supported by law. And if you have any kind of heritage sites that you want to highlight in your maybe thesis or maybe uh, we went through our street proposals. I don't think anyone presented any uh, streets with heritage sites. <laughs> But yeah, that's just uh, the simple, um, the summary of like heritage conservation in the Philippines. It's already supported by law. The problem is we don't have much kanang enforcement. It's a law, but there's not much kanang enforcing going on like the, the, usual, the usual story in the Philippines. And then just a quick overview of um, planning hierarchy. So currently there's really no sort of urban planning, urban design hierarchy. So we have to refer to the urban planning hierarchy, basically the order of urban uh, development or like the different levels of urban development in the Philippines. There's a national level, regional, provincial, and the local level. We'll, we'll discuss more on this kanang next week when I complete my slides, but I'll just give you an overview tonight. So um, at the national level and all the way down to the local level, there are three types of sort of policies or kanang, kanang plans. Um, us urban designers and urban planners, we're more focused on the physical framework plan because as architects, uh, landscape architects, engineers, we're focused on the physical side. So we will refer to the physical framework and comprehensive land use plans. Uh, depending on where you are, uh, your local community might have or might not have a CLUP, but definitely we have a national physical framework plan. Um, I think it wasn't updated and for, from last time I checked, there wasn't much drawings. It's more like kind of descriptions of what to do. Um, where you have a lot of drawings is really the um, CLUP because at that level, you can really design now. At the regional and provincial level, you really can't design anything. It's more policy making because you don't want to have a bottom, a, a top bottom approach because that's basically uh, has been proven to, to fail like in the kind of pre-World War One. That was the way they did planning then. Now it's we're more focused on bottom-up development. So um, nationals should just give a guideline and then the locals should be the one to implement the design. And then over here is just a, uh, on the right side are just the different maps in um, region seven. So we have uh, um, Cebu province, Bohol, uh, the Negros Oriental, and then, um, I can't, Surigao, is that Surigao? No, that's not Surigao, I forget. <laughs> what is this purple area here? Let me go back to my map. That's Cebu province, Bohol province, and Sikihor. Sorry, it's S. <laughs> okay, and then at the local level, we have our different municipalities and cities. And wherever you are, there's a lot of these guys. And ideally, all of these municipalities should have been, there should be clear communication with each other pro, because the Philippines is still not at that stage where communication is very kind of open, transparent, and easily available. What we have is sort of kind of, sort of segregated development and like sort of in uh, uncoordinated development. And that's hopefully something that we can sort of advise to our like our local community that we need to work together with our neighbors and then if we're fortunate enough to have, uh, uh, if our local community has a CLUP, 
uh, please let me know and send me a copy if your local community has a CLUP in Cebu province. I don't think we have one. We just have the guideline. And then um, I think the current administration, the current mayor is working on this in Cebu province. Please let me know if your local area still already has a CLUP or is currently working on it. And then where does urban designers, um, where do urban designers kick, uh, work is really here in the, uh, wherever their <clears throat> wherever their structure. So here in the lowland, upland level, and maybe even the coastal marine level. And sometimes, let's just say the whole thing, but depending on where the population is. So urban designers will go where the population is. Maybe uh, environmental planners, will focus more on the bigger picture, but urban designers really focus on streets, uh, road networks, basically where the people are and how we can improve their kind of, uh, quality of life. And then for those not aware, this is just a simple diagram of like the comprehensive land use plan process. So it takes about 18 months, ideally. So you see here the breakdown, the first two months is the organization, the identifying of stakeholders, the vision setting uh, up to month five, and then anal an an analysis of the existing like project, like what are the uh, strengths, weaknesses, creating base maps, data gathering, mapping results, uh, consultations, and needs assessment. And then finally, on around like month nine, you will have the uh, setting of goals and objectives. And then after that, you can prepare the land use plan around, uh, let's see here, it says month 13. So a year after like organization, uh, site analysis, identifying stakeholders, then the plan, the proposed plan will come out and then it includes a public hearing. So sometimes they do that in the Philippines. I'm not so sure. Even in Australia, public hearings are kind of difficult to attend. It's not really kind of, uh, they create announcements, but if you're not aware, you, you just like ignore it. Uh, and then like the only people who go there are the really kind of um, uh, socially active. And usually these are the older population. The younger population really don't care about what, what's going on in their city. Okay. And then sort of the who makes the C CLUP, you have um, different groups here. Uh, you have the planning officers, architects, urban planners. Notice there's no urban designers because urban designers are lumped together with the urban planners. Um, under that is the support group. You have the encoders, the kanang legal experts. And then I, I keep forgetting what... I know the G is group, but these are the, I guess, the, the local specialists. You have uh, people from the social sector, the economic sector, uh, people who are familiar with the local infrastructure, um, academe, the um, coastal and marine sort of uh, representatives, heritage representatives, everyone just working together. And this is something that for me was really good in Australia because we had people from different departments, different um, uh, offices coming together here in the Philippines because uh, urban design, urban planning is not so much well known. Most of our enrollees are architects and engineers. We barely have anyone uh, in the post-grad, as far as I know, who works with Kanang Heritage, who is from the Kanang, uh, what do you call this? Uh, social groups, economic groups. Most of us have like architectural background. So Atong Output is really more focused on architecture and engineering. Sometimes I think I had like an engineer student, a couple of engineer students that like just at the beginning of the pandemic, but after that, uh, mostly uh, architects lang and landscape architects uh, ang mga students. Okay, and then eventually, um, as urban planners, we need to be aware with the, uh, sorry, urban designers, we need to be aware of what the urban planners are doing, as I mentioned earlier. So if your local community has sort of a, a CLUP or a roadmap, um, please share that. Br please bring that along next week because that will also be part of our discussion. In Cebu, uh, we had the Metro Cebu um, land, uh, Maklats, I forgot, Metro Cebu land use transportation, land use and transportation, forget the S. <laughs> There's so many. Hmm? 
No, it's a, <laughs> I forget the word. But anyway, focus on land use and transportation. And the idea was to sort of create new centers in Cebu City. Um, this was 2000s and it's, it has, it's currently being updated. The current form is Cebu City, Mandawa City, and Lapu-Laspu City will be the work centers, the CBDs, if you will. And then hopefully this will be kind of the form or the design these cities will take will be connected to transit-oriented development. And uh, we didn't have time to talk about the 15-minute city today, but we'll talk about that next week, um, mostly because I ran out of time to prepare the slides. But the idea is each of these work areas should have um, proper kind of public transportation. And then if you see here, I'll zoom in a bit more. Ah, like so, bring to the front. You see here, there's this like green line here. And that's what uh, the local uh, government, uh, working together with the Academe at San Carlos, um, this was proposed by our dean, uh, former Dean Yumi Espina, currently working with the planning department of Cebu City. This is what they propose, um, the green loop. So it's a sort of transportation or a, um, a corridor for vehicles, bicycles, and not so much walking because it's very, it's very large. But I think they also include like proper sidewalks. So the idea is to connect these three major cities with a transportation corridor that's both attractive and functional. So it has like vegetation, blah, blah, blah. And we'll talk more about that um, next week. So when, when I get my slides ready. <laughs> but yeah, so the idea is why I brought up the um, urban urban development patterns module is so you have an idea of like how do cities develop so usually they go outwards from a center and now we talk we're talking about local community development so pod's neighborhood units how we divide the land within those like um big uh big cities and ideally they're supposed to be a transportation corridor that connects everything so this is more on the planning side, but on the urban design side, the transportation corridor, as you've done with your kind of midterm projects, needs to have proper sidewalks. The side, the streets themselves need to be arranged properly. So segregate um, non-motorized traffic, walking and cycling from vehicle traffic, the uh, motorized traffic, the cars, the buses, the trucks. So that separation should be there. And then our designs can be implemented uh, for the whole city, like um, we need to identify the correct streets, we need to identify the correct areas, and then the design should adjust to those areas. And then basically, um, this is more urban planning side. Um, in Cebu City, how the projects are financed, uh, usually we have foreign investors. This is JICA, a Japanese company, who will uh, work with the department of, what's DOF again, it's a bank thing. Let me just Google that real quickly. Philippines, the Department of Finance. So F is finance. And then basically the loans and the money will go through like LGUs, NGOs. It will be used to support private public partnerships. And then there's there will be a consolidated fund, an estimated budget. And then that will go through the Metro Cebu development and um, the Metro Cebu Development and Coordination Board, that's MCDCB, your local area might have something similar. And then that they will use that money to pay the, the professionals to create the plans, to do the research, and then have the projects. And then ideally, that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> but that's whether it will, it's a whole nother story. So going back to our like proposals here, so going so going finals, uh, my vision for this class is at the end of like um, December, like our the end of classes, we'll have sort of a clear proposal, like um, really draw out. Uh, where was that section? There's no, the section wasn't here. Yes, <laughs> really... presentation lang po. Ah, okay, no problem. So during December, at December na, we'll have our sort of street level development and connecting it to the city level like proposals so 
um, we have one month, maybe at week two, two weeks from now, we can sort of collate or combine our knowledge on the local kanang. Um, if your city has a comprehensive land use plan, if not, we'll just use um, other land use plans as a guide. And then basically my vision is that we'll include a kind of introduction like this, we'll include the site analysis like this, and then we'll have a proposal with the plan and the sections, and then our rationale for each of those sections. And basically something a bit better than what I did, let's go to my projects here, pedestrianization, where is the final presentation? So this is basically my document. I was working with Cebu Leads. So we had like a, our concept here. We have our plan here. I am i don't have sections because just it was very quick, like within the span of like two months and I was still teaching. So nakabuang you cook, create second drawings. So they were very, very basic. So I, my goal was just to present the before and after because I feel like that's very convincing to non-architects. So that's also another thing. Our presentations should be understandable, not just to other architects, but also to the lay people. Now, we can create better sort of urban environments. And then, yeah, this will be our kanang final. You don't have to, we don't have to follow this format. Um, we can do it like poster style with like a A3 landscape, similar to what you're doing here in class. So basically it's still this project, but with kanang more information and like sort of a, um we really want it to be kind of convincing because with your urban design degree or urban planning degree this is the kind of work you'll be going into so the more convincing your final project is the better your grade and then i'll talk to you i'll help you out with every step and then that's our goal for the end of december okay 824 okay so with that um I'll end here because I still need to finish my slides and busy because uh, midterm grades. And uh, Benson, please stay. Uh, we'll have like a short talk. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Okay, I'll just read here. Comment me, Richard. Hostile architectures, urban strategy. Oh, to restrict kanang. Oh, katosa about the homeless people. Oh, that's another kanang. Like it's another like piece of topic. <laughs> that my problem with like hostile architectures. It's very kanang inhumane. The the name is in there like hostile. So we don't want like hostile architecture, I think, for the most part. Okay, so we can end here.